Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 78 of Ben Franklin's World the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. Whether you're a Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, or perhaps just someone who takes a keen interest in the politics of the United States, I think we can agree on the fact that the U.S. is in the midst of a deep political divide. Political divisions are not new, but the last time the United States faced this deep of a divide, it tore the nation apart, literally, It was the Civil War period. Can history help us solve our present-day political crisis? Today, we speak with Rachel Sheldon, an assistant professor of American history at the University of Oklahoma and author of Washington Brotherhood, Politics, Social Life, and the Coming of the Civil War. Rachel is an expert on the political and social history of the antebellum or pre-war period, and she's going to help us investigate whether the past might help us narrow the divide we face in our present. During our investigation, Rachel reveals the political parties and political divisions that existed in the United States during the 1840s and 1850s, social society in Washington, D.C. during the antebellum period, and where women and African Americans fit into that society, and whether life in antebellum Washington, D.C. offers any lessons that might help us solve the political divisions confronting the United States today. Are you ready to take a tour of Washington, D.C. and its social life during the 1840s and 1850s? Let's go meet our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is an assistant professor of American history at the University of Oklahoma. She specializes in law, politics, and slavery in the 19th century. Her book, Washington Brotherhood, Politics, Social Life, and the Coming of the Civil War received an honorable mention for the Wiley Silver Prize for the best first book on the American Civil War. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Rachel Sheldon. Thank you so much for having me. Rachel, it's great that we have you on the show because you're a timely guest. As you know, the United States is experiencing a period of intense political and cultural polarization. However, as you demonstrate in your book, Washington Brotherhood, This isn't the first time the United States has experienced a deep political divide. The politics of the 1840s and 1850s also divided Americans. So, Rachel, would you provide us with an overview of the political divisions that took hold in the 1840s and 1850s and how those divisions affected American society? Actually, what's happening today is a good comparison in some ways, because a lot of the issues of the 1840s and 1850s mirror the things that we're concerned about today. Issues like race, immigration, the economy, religion, things that actually really concern Americans in the 1840s and 1850s. And their frustration and anger with the political system really showed itself through a variety of political activities in this period and through a variety of political parties. That's one way in which it's slightly different. There was a lot of flux in the political system in this period. Political parties were fluid. So we have the two-party system we've had for uh, quite some time now, but in the 1840s and 50s, there was no such insistence that there must be two parties to take on these different political problems. And so when one party was not answering to the political needs of its constituents, people would look elsewhere. They would look outside the political system or they would look to new parties. So in the 1840s and 1850s, you have a variety of different political organizations. You have the Democrats, they're a mainstay, but you also have the Whigs, who are around in the 1840s and early 1850s, the Know Nothing Party, which was a party that was anti-immigrant, particularly anti-Catholic, and tended to answer to the demands of people who were uncomfortable with the continuing movement of immigrants into particularly New England and the northern United States. You had the Republican Party growing in this period. Republicans were answering to the demands of anti-slavery activists. Not all were in favor of abolishing slavery immediately. In fact, many were not. But there was a semblance of 
belief that it was important to get rid of slavery in the long term. And you had another group called the Constitutional Unionists, people who were very concerned about maintaining the Constitution. So you had all of these different political parties that were trying to answer the needs of constituents, and parties were often in flux as a result of that. It sounds like there were a lot of political parties, which means there must have been a lot of hot button issues that affected antebellum American society. Would you provide us with an overview of what issues polarized American society at that time? The most important, of course, is slavery. Slavery is going to be on the minds of most Americans in some form. In the South, of course, slaveholders are very concerned about keeping their slaves. Non-slaveholders are also very concerned about maintaining white supremacy. In the North, there is quite a bit of racism, but there's also this sort of underlying desire to eventually get rid of slavery, or in some cases, immediately get rid of slavery. But there are also other issues that are related to slavery in some ways, but also concern other issues like the economy. In the late 1850s, there's a small depression that really starts to take hold that really concerns many Americans. They are worried about their jobs. They're worried about their pay. And as I mentioned just a minute ago, immigration had become a very big issue in the 1850s. And people were very concerned about Catholics in particular, which is why the Know Nothing Party became very popular in certain places in the North. The thing about these political issues is that they would influence the way that political parties talked to their constituents. So, for example, Republicans often had to cater to some northern voters who might be interested in the anti-slavery movement, but also very concerned about immigrants and would have to shift their message in areas where they would really need to get the support of those kinds of voters. So there's a lot of catering to various opinions, but also strong ideological beliefs among the various parties. It seems like Washington, D.C. would have experienced the polarization of antebellum politics more intensely than other cities because you have all of these representatives from all of these different parties gathering for sessions of Congress. So would you tell us what Washington, D.C. was like during the 1840s and 1850s? So this is really what interests me the most, which is that the politicians who come to Washington, you would assume, would come with these very strong ideological beliefs, and many of them did. But they come to Washington and they enter this sort of odd community that's very small that requires people who might strongly disagree to interact in a series of both political and social experiences that might change the way that they think about the person on the other side, or at least allow for more conversation. There was still plenty of animosity between, for example, abolitionist congressmen and very strong pro-slavery congressmen from the South. But it was less than you would assume, because what happens is you get these folks in Congress interacting in a variety of social activities, at bars, in housing arrangements where they're living together, at church, in voluntary associations like the Freemasons, for example, where they're going to get to know each other more personally. And sometimes they don't like each other, but frequently this creates much more sort of understanding than you would otherwise assume. I like to think about it like a fraternity where you have a bunch of guys getting together and spending time together. And not everybody in the fraternity likes one another, but there is this sort of shared experience of being a politician in Washington. Washington is a weird place in this time period, in part because you sort of have two Washingtons. You have the locals, the people who live there year-round, who are doing all kinds of things outside of the political realm. And then you have the politicians who operate really just in the area from where the capital is or right around the capital up to the White House. There were outliers. Some people lived in Georgetown and in Calorama. But for the most part, the politicians lived in this very small area in Washington, D.C., and they're not going to interact quite as much with the people who live there year round. So it's almost like this little bubble that they're operating in, almost inside the Beltway before there was a Beltway. Today, it seems like we can insulate ourselves a lot from differing political opinions. Were the congressmen and senators of the 1840s and 50s able to insulate themselves in Washington, D.C.? And what I mean by that, did they settle in neighborhoods with like-minded people, like in a strictly Republican, know-nothing, or Democratic neighborhood? 
So that's a great question. And the answer is no. There was almost no way to avoid interacting with someone from a different political party. Today is very different in the sense because, you know, congressmen come to Washington for usually two or three days in the week. and They can just stop in and leave and no problem. They aren't really needing to interact with people except maybe on the floor of Congress, Senate or the floor of the House. But in the 19th century, it was often very challenging to get to Washington if you came from a place like, say, Illinois. And so you would come to Washington for the entire session and you would find a living arrangement where you would stay for the entire session, usually without your wife. Although by the time of the Civil War, a few more congressmen are starting to bring their wives. But initially, it's really just guys. They're coming and they're coming without their wives and they're boarding together, typically. Many, many, many politicians, a majority in this period, board either in a hotel or in a boarding house where there was sort of like an innkeeper, someone who made breakfast and lunch and dinner. And you would have a small group of men, anywhere from three to 15 men who lived in the house and would eat together and interact in parlors and whatnot. And so in those cases, you typically had politicians who were not necessarily from the same section and not necessarily from the same party. It was more common to be from the same party. So it was more common, for example, for a group of Democrats to live together. But it was actually unusual if you were a congressman who was not living with either someone from the other section or someone from the other party. It was much more common to be someone who lived in a house with someone who had a very different political perspective from you. And if you didn't live in a boarding house or in a hotel, you were guaranteed to live in a neighborhood where there would be people from other perspectives, people from other ideological positions or from other party positions or from sectional differences. And so as a result, you were almost forced in your living arrangements to interact with people who were different from you. Pat would like to know more about what life was like in these boarding houses. He notes that in the 1850s, many prominent Southern senators lived under one roof in a boarding house. Did these senators choose the same boarding house on purpose or was this just a coincidence? So this is a really great question. I'm sure what Pat is referring to is the very famous F Street mess, which was a group of Southern Democrats who had been living together for some time. They're very famous in part because they helped produce the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which is in 1854, which is a famous piece of legislation that makes Kansas and Nebraska open to slavery with the possibility of popular sovereignty, the idea that the people are going to vote in those territories, whether they want slavery or not. Previously, Kansas and Nebraska had been closed to slavery as a result of the Missouri Compromise. And so the Kansas-Nebraska Act negates this. And it's considered to be a very important moment in the coming of the Civil War because it's the start of the spread of slavery to the North and also because it produces all kinds of violence and difficulty in Kansas, what's known as bleeding Kansas. And it's true that these congressmen are primarily, although not entirely, responsible for the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and they were able to do this kind of thing, to put together the Kansas-Nebraska Act, in part because they lived together in a house in Washington, the famed F Street mess. And some of their neighbors, actually, people who lived down the block from them, were also involved in this. Philip Phillips, who's a congressman from Alabama, comes and helps them write the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And Stephen Douglas from Illinois, Lincoln's famed rival in the Stephen Douglas-Abraham Lincoln debates of 1858, they are both engaging with the F Street Mass to try to put together the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And so it's a great example of how living together could produce legislation. But it's unusual because this is a situation where Southerners are living together alone. So in some ways, it's representative because of the ways in which they're able to put together legislation. And in other ways, it's not representative because it just happened to be a Southern mess. But the fact that they lived in a neighborhood that tended to be not just including Southern Democrats shows that there was the possibility for people of different sections to engage with legislation just by being neighbors, just by getting together. Living arrangements sound like they were a very important aspect of congressional and Washington society. But what about social society? Rosa would like to know more about social life and parties in antebellum Washington, D.C. 
Yeah, so Washington was sort of a raucous place, and that goes very well with my analogy to a fraternity. It was sort of like a fraternity party a lot of the time. There were a lot of parties and balls and individual dinners that would happen at boarding houses or at the homes of folks who bought houses in Washington who were congressmen. So on a weekly basis, if you were someone who came to Washington as a congressman or a senator or a Supreme Court justice or a member of the executive department in the cabinet, you were almost guaranteed to have a full calendar of events every week. You would have maybe a ball on a Tuesday and you would have two dinners on Wednesday and Thursday. At least you could be invited to these. Maybe you would decide not to go. But so typically, these involve a range of a number of people. If you were a member of the cabinet, for example, you were likely to go to the giant parties at the White House that happened, the receptions that happened there. And you were also likely to have people at your house because you were guaranteed to have a reception at your own house once a week. The cabinet members were sort of required by social etiquette to have reception days. You might go to some friends for dinner, you know, just maybe 10 or 12 men together discussing whatever's on their mind, or you might go to a party thrown by a man and his wife who he brought to Washington, or a socialite who happened to live in Washington, Dolly Madison, the wife of James Madison, actually was famous for throwing parties in Washington, D.C. So this would be an experience where you were going to engage, again, with people from different sections and from different parties. And sometimes these would be very formal experiences. You would go and you would dress up and you would be engaging with people in a formal way. And sometimes they were much more casual. And typically dinners that happen in the home would be much more casual. And there would be lots of political talk, lots of discussion about what was happening in Congress and what was happening in the Supreme Court, for example. And then even if you went to a more formal event, you engage in sort of the formal procedure of introducing and talking with one another. But the political discussion could drip into those circumstances as well. You would see people in the corner at a president's reception discussing the political issues of the day. So social life in Washington was very much a part of the day-to-day experience. And if you were a politician in this period, you wanted to be part of this. If you did not engage with it, you didn't have much of a voice in politics. Politicians who lived in Washington would engage in the House of Representatives and the Senate, but not in the ways that we imagine them to, not in the ways that we think of when we think about Congress in this period. We think of Congress as being this place where people go and they argue and they discuss the debate of the political issues of the day and they debate these things and they work out compromises and they work out various bills and that's where things happen. But in fact, that's not really what it was like to be a senator or a congressman in this period. A lot of what happened on the floor of Congress was not particularly representative of the ways that people engaged in policy making. It was a slightly different experience. So when they wanted to really talk seriously about what was going on politically, they did it outside the halls of Congress and parties and balls and individual dinners tended to be the places where this happened. A lot of lawmaking seems to have taken place in social settings. Unlike Congress, women were allowed to participate in these balls, dinners, and parties. Did Washington, D.C. social life provide women with access to the lawmaking process? Well, certainly the wives of some politicians did engage in political discussion, although they were not necessarily privy to all the discussion of politics that was happening in these parties. So what would happen often is if you had, for example, a White House dinner, the wife of the president or the president's hostess would take the women into the women's reception room after dinner and they would chat while the men would go and have cigars in their own reception room. And as a result, the men would have time to talk politics there. But women weren't excluded. Certainly there was lots of discussion in front of women and A wife could certainly have a say (laughs) with her husband in this period. And women facilitated a lot of the discussion that was happening outside of the halls of Congress by throwing parties, by being part of the social scene. And there's another element to this that's very odd to us today, but that's the system of calling that existed in Washington in this period. If you were the wife of a congressman, for example, it was your duty upon arriving in Washington to visit, to call on the wives of any other politicians who were in your station, so at the station of 
representative and all of those above you. So you had to call on the wives of the representatives and the wives of the senators and the wives of the Supreme Court justices and the wives of the cabinet members. And so this was your duty. You had to go around and introduce yourself. And then those women had to return your calls if they didn't see you when you came in. So this is a pretty exhausting experience, if you can imagine it. As a woman coming to Washington, you spent most of your days going from house to house, calling on women who were above your social station. And then if you were a woman at one of those top tiers of the social stations, if you happened to be the wife of a cabinet member, you had to return all those calls. So you also had to engage in that. So women played an important role in sort of keeping up the official duties of their husbands when they came to Washington. And they also played this role in sort of facilitating the parties and balls where a lot of the political conversation was happening. There weren't as many women. It was much more male than we are used to in Washington. But the women who did come did have to play an important role. Thus far, we have discussed a really white world a world of white men and white women. But I also have to imagine that at these parties and callings, these white men and women were interacting with enslaved and free African-Americans. Did African-Americans gain any useful information from their attendance at these events? And we should note that most white Americans viewed African-American attendance as invisible. You know, this is a really good question, and I don't write much about this in my own work, in part because I think a lot of politicians just ignored anything that they saw. They're engaging with questions about slavery and yet not really talking as much about the slaves that they see. I found this particularly fascinating in my own research that there were several hotels in Washington that had slave pens in their basements. And so politicians could come with their slaves and their slaves would be kept in the slave pens while they're working, these Southern politicians. And Northerners, even anti-slavery Northerners, did not refrain from staying in those hotels simply because there were slave pens. And they don't even really comment on them in their letters, which I find really fascinating. I'm sure that there were some who noticed the slaves themselves had to be really engaged with what was going on. And certainly they are trying repeatedly to influence policy. And in some cases, they do a really amazing job at this. There are several cases of slaves who run away from their masters when they are brought to Washington, D.C. And these enslaved peoples make an effort to actually change the conversation by doing this. They also sue for freedom or try to push for certain kinds of policies, and certainly some lawmakers would have responded to this. There's a really wonderful book about this uh, written by Stanley Harold called Subversive, which is about the African-American community in Washington, D.C., and they played an incredible role in the day-to-day activities of Washington, although less in this sort of official politician-centric center, so more on the periphery. And there was an incredibly vibrant Black community that engaged outside the political realm, in addition to having some influence within the political realm. We've talked about boarding houses, we've talked about calling, and we've talked about balls. Were there any other social activities that went on in antebellum Washington, D.C. that helped to shape its collegial, nonpartisan atmosphere? So my favorite of these is always the drinking rooms and bar rooms, which were really prevalent in Washington in this period. Politicians like to drink. They like to drink everywhere. They like to drink on the floor of the House of Representatives and the floor of the Senate. They like to drink when they were in the Supreme Court rooms, and they really like to drink after work. And so they would often go to bars together, and this was one way that you could bond with other politicians. And sometimes those bars were not just bars, but were gambling dens. And so after the session was over, after the day's work was over, you and a couple of buddies might go up to one of the famous gambling dens on Pennsylvania Avenue and try to make some money for the night. And there were a couple who were very successful in making large sums of money. And so they would, you know, relax and talk with friends. And this was a way for them to engage more generally. There are other places that politicians socialize ones that we might think of more readily. Church was a place where you had a lot of cross-sectional relationships. Fellow politicians would go to church depending upon their denomination. And so as a result of that, you ended up with some politicians attending church together that you wouldn't really imagine given their sectional proclivities. And Washington churches were not all divided in the way they were the rest of the country by the late 1850s, although 
for example, the Methodists had a schism earlier in this period, the Methodist churches in D.C. were not completely divided. And as a result, you would have Methodists attending church together who happened to be from the North and from the South. You could also engage together in some of the voluntary associations. The Freemasons were very popular in Washington, D.C., and if you were a Freemason from another section of the country, you were likely to engage with other Freemasons from a place that you may not be quite as familiar with. And you could make your own organizations, and this happened quite frequently. Abraham Lincoln, for example, was part of a group called the Young Indian Club, which was a group of politicians in the House of Representatives that was committed to electing Zachary Taylor president. They wanted him to be nominated on the Whig ticket in 1848, and they wanted to elect him president. And he became friendly with several Southern politicians as a result of this, including Alexander Stevens, the future vice president of the Confederacy. Lincoln and Stevens really bonded while trying to push for Zachary Taylor's nomination in the Whig Party, and they would talk politics, and they would talk about what was going on in the House of Representatives. So there were a lot of ways that politicians would do what we do today, which is to have a lot of interests and to socialize and to think about themselves as more complicated than simply we're the constituents that they were representing. How did this social and collegial atmosphere of Washington, D.C. affect the work of congressmen and senators? I asked because if senators and congressmen knew each other personally, how did they deal with the intense, often personal debates that we read about in books and newspaper accounts about antebellum America? Right. Much of what I'm saying is probably very surprising because we think of Washington in this period as being incredibly divisive. You think about, for example, the caning of Charles Sumner on the floor of the Senate, where he was beaten by Preston Brooks within an inch of his life. And you think about congressmen bringing guns and bowie knives to the floor of the House. And so, yeah, this is not something that you would imagine. And in part, we've been convinced by this because the rhetoric on the floor of the House of Representatives and the Senate tended to be very sharp. And if you read the Congressional Globe, which is the record of the congressional debate during this period, you get this sense that things are very tense. But my reading of the Congressional Globe and what happened outside of Congress, outside of the Capitol building, suggests actually that these debates that are recorded in the Congressional Globe are not really representative of the way that politicians were talking to one another. What's in the Congressional Globe is actually a series of speeches that are aimed at constituents. And what they called this in the 19th century was bunkum, bunkum speechmaking. And bunkum speechmaking was basically a speech that you made specifically to please your constituents that probably had very little bearing on what was happening in Congress at that moment. So, for example, a congressman from South Carolina who did not like something that a northerner was doing and knew that his constituents would be upset, thinking that this anti-slavery group was coming in to take their slaves and to change Southern society, would give a very fiery speech on the floor of the House of Representatives saying, this is not what we are in this country for, and these northerners are not real Americans, and all kinds of things to try to insult their northern colleagues. They would say nasty things about their northern colleagues. And this was aimed at their constituents so that the constituents would be pleased with their congressman and reelect him. <laughs> not unlike much of what happens actually in Congress today. C-SPAN captures this all the time, you know, a, a congressman speaking mostly to an empty house. And this is actually quite representative of what it was like in the 19th century. If you were giving a speech on the floor of the house in the 19th century, the likelihood that people were there or listening to you was very, very small. The House of Representatives operated as a place where people did other business. They wrote letters home. They didn't have offices. They didn't have the modern frills of offices and staff. So they wrote letters home. They wrote letters to their constituents. They slept. Often they were very tired. They slept. They went to the other chamber to sort of hear what was going on there. They conducted other business. They just decided not to show up at the house that day. Even more troubling, maybe, they were in a very small room in the basement of the Capitol called the Hole in the Wall, which was basically a bar so they could be drinking. So what happened on the floor of the house is not really captured in the Congressional Globe. It's a very particular way of seeing that is really more an official record as opposed to a real record of how congressmen were engaging. And so what happens is in the 1840s and 50s, this becomes even more prominent in 
the Congressional Globe, these sort of fiery, nasty speeches, and even less representative of what's happening outside of the halls of Congress, because constituents were demanding this kind of rhetoric from their representatives and senators, and you couldn't get anything done that way. And so when politicians wanted to pass laws, they really didn't do it on the floor of the House or Senate. I feel like I've been hoodwinked, and I don't even live in the 19th century. I mean... (laughs) It's like there's two worlds, right? There's the official world and then there's the unofficial world and all the cool stuff is happening in this unofficial world that no one knows about. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really true in a sense because what you have in the 19th century is politicians who are really concerned about keeping their jobs, much like today, and who understand that their constituents want to hear a particular kind of speech. And what's amazing about the Globe, the Congressional Globe, is that sometimes you even have speeches in the Congressional Globe that nobody ever gave. So a young politician, a freshman politician, someone who's just been elected to the House, would sometimes convince the person who printed the Congressional Globe to insert a speech that he had given that he had actually never given in front of the House in order to please his constituents. And part of the reason for this is that most congressmen who had been serving in Washington for many years really did not want to hear from their freshman colleagues. They didn't know who they were. They didn't really care who they were. And so, yeah, the only way to really please your constituents if you were a freshman and you weren't giving a speech is to insert your speech into the Congressional Globe. It's really fascinating. We have to take the context of what's going on with these official documents really seriously. And in some ways, again, very similar to the way that people engage today. Certainly, bunkum speechmaking still happens today. Jessica would like to know how lobbyists added to this mix of real and staged debates in antebellum America. Did lobbyists exist in the 1840s and 1850s? And if so, did they attempt to sway the votes of congressmen and senators? This is a great question. And lobbyists did not exist in the 19th century to the same degree that they do today. Today, we think about lobbyists being everywhere. But there were some in the 19th century, and probably the most famous example was a group of lobbyists who wanted to make sure that the Compromise of 1850, bringing in all of the territory from Mexico acquired in the Mexican War, would have some sort of settlement. And they were particularly interested in this because they had invested in Texas bonds. So they were going to make a lot of money if the government paid Texas's debt and everything worked out in the West. And so they lobbied really hard for a settlement in 1850 to get the Compromise of 1850 through. And what they did is exactly what you would imagine. They wined and dined all of these congressmen. The most famous of these lobbyists was a man by the name of William Corcoran, who was a famous banker in Washington, D.C. in this period, now known perhaps for his art gallery, the Corcoran Gallery in Washington, D.C. But he was a famous socialite and lived in Washington for many years and really invested in Texas bonds. And so he would host these lavish dinner parties. They were famous in Washington. Folks who were invited to them commented all the time about the incredible food and drinks that he would provide. And he would have these parties. And what he would do is he would invite congressmen and senators who were on the fence about a particular issue and try to get them together with the people who were really in favor of the Compromise of 1850. And so they would sort of be pushing to try to get people on board. There's no smoking gun to say that this ever actually worked, but certainly they tried. And some more backroom dealings, more sort of shady backroom dealings could produce vote switching. This would happen much more, you know, over drinks or I'll give you some money if you pass this bill. But generally, there was just a lot of trying to convince congressmen that this was in their best interest. And we don't have a lot of real evidence that all of this money was changing hands, but there were rumors that flew around in Washington about it in this period. Rachel, you really revealed what Washington, D.C. was like in the 1840s and 1850s. It seems like a congenial place where everything is being done at some backroom party or drinking hole. But I wonder What happens when we fast forward a bit? What happened to the atmosphere of Washington, D.C. when the southern states began seceding from the Union in December 1860? Yeah, this is a really good question. So you would assume immediately that things would completely fall apart. And in fact, that's not really the case. 
In December 1860, a new session of Congress begins, and politicians are doing the same thing that they had been doing for some time. They're still having parties together. They're still having dinners. They're still engaging in other kinds of activities. For example, there are lots of associations that meet in Washington during this period. For example, the American Colonization Society meets in Washington. Their sort of national meeting meets in Washington during this period, and politicians from both sides of the country, both northern and southern, come and meet together. So voluntary associations are meeting the same way. Still lots of drinking, still lots of bunkum speech making. It becomes very tense, of course, because some of the southern senators and congressmen are going to leave Washington and give very significant speeches on their way out saying, you know, I need to leave the union because I need to go with my state or with my section. The most famous of these, of course, is Jefferson Davis, who leaves the Senate in January 1861. And he gives this very passionate speech in the Senate saying how he has to go to be with his section. And he's very emotional about it. And he leaves the Senate very upset and tells some friends that he's walking home with, this is the saddest day of my life. And in part, you might assume that this is because he's leaving the union, but I think also because he's leaving his position as a politician in Washington. He'd been in Washington for many, many, many years serving in the Senate and also in the cabinet. And so this is a really hard day for him to leave Washington amid all of the continued socializing and backroom dealing that's going on. Before we move into the time warp, I have to ask, do you think there are any lessons from life in antebellum Washington, D.C. that would help today's senators and congressmen bridge our current political divide? This is a good question, and it's sort of a mixed bag. I mean, one thing that's very different about politicians in this period is that they are talking to one another much more frequently. So they're able to get to know each other better than politicians today typically are. It's very rare, I think, now for politicians from different sides of the aisle to get together socially without some sort of comment from the press. But in the 19th century, the press was sort of in on it. They did not necessarily report as much on cross-sectional relationships. And so those tended to happen behind closed doors much more easily. But there is a consequence of this, and that is that politicians in Washington in the 19th century could be very insulated. They could really have a misunderstanding of what's going on in the rest of the country because of these relationships that they made. And maybe that's not a good lesson either. (laughs) Uh, Certainly, it made people like Jefferson Davis and others very surprised that secession moved as quickly as it did because they had a misunderstanding of their constituents. They didn't fully understand how serious things were on the ground. And certainly there are parallels to today when we talk about the political system where the people were very unhappy with their federal political system. They were rejecting the politicians who were doing the work for them. They didn't think that they were being responsive to their needs. And so I'm not sure they have many lessons for our politicians today. And certainly they were just as nasty on the floors of Congress. And there was also lots of violence in Washington. It was a much more violent time. Some of them engaged in duels. And certainly the caning of Charles Sumner is a very good example of this. So probably we don't want to repeat that. But uh, in, in terms of the sociability between members, perhaps that could be something they could teach our modern politicians. It's time for the Time Warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In Washington Brotherhood, Rachel describes the personal relationship between Abraham Lincoln and Kentucky Senator John J. Crittenden. In 1858, Crittenden surprised Lincoln by supporting his political rival, Stephen Douglas, for senator. Lincoln took Crittenden's support for Douglas very personally, and this may have affected some of Lincoln's decision making in 1860. So, Rachel... In your opinion, what might have happened if in 1858 John J. Crittenden had supported Abraham Lincoln for Senate instead of Stephen Douglas? I mean, how would the course of history be different? It's a good question. I'm, you know, I'm not sure it would have been different. It's certainly something that surprised Lincoln and may have affected his behavior upon becoming 
president, I think one possibility would have been that he would have considered John Crittenden for a position in his cabinet had he not been so irritated with Crittenden about his behavior in 1858. Crittenden had been a long time moderate in Washington. He had taken the place of Henry Clay, who was known as the Great Compromiser, and he was often sort of a voice of reason among people from the North and South. And Lincoln had really respected Crittenden in his time in Washington. He'd gotten to know him a little bit when he was in the Young Indian Club. And so he might have thought that Crittenden would have been a good person to put in his cabinet, perhaps as attorney general. Crittenden was quite old by the time uh, we get to 1861, but he still had a very important voice in politics. And I'm not sure that would have kept anybody in the union. I'm not sure that deep South states would have stayed in. I'm not sure it would have kept the upper South states in, but it might have changed the way that some people calculated what they were doing in 1860. Maybe it would have put off secession for just a little bit more time had Lincoln brought more Southerners into his cabinet. Crittenden coming from Kentucky. I'm not sure that Crittenden supporting Lincoln would have given Lincoln the 1858 senatorial election. Douglas defeats him, not as soundly as Douglas would like, but he defeats him. It's possible that Crittenden's support pushed Douglas over the edge. So if Lincoln had gotten the support of Crittenden, perhaps he would have won the 1858 senatorial election. Perhaps he would not have been president then. It was much harder, I think, for a sitting senator or congressman to get the nomination. Perhaps in 1860, William Seward was the other potential possibility or the most prominent possibility in 1860. And if Lincoln had been serving in the Senate, I'm not sure if his chances would have been as good or maybe they would have been better. Hard to say. But certainly it affected Lincoln personally. And he felt very strongly about it in a way that I think really influenced his opinion of Crittenden later on when he becomes president. Rachel, what are you researching now? I'm working on a project on the political history of the Supreme Court in the 19th century from about the 1830s to the 1890s. I'm interested in how the Supreme Court operated as a political body, not just as a legal body, and particularly how Supreme Court justices worked within the federal political system, not just their social experiences, but through their understanding of their roles as politicians, not just judges. And if we still have questions about 19th century politics, where can we look to find more information about you and how we can get in contact with you? Well, I'd be delighted to have any emails or questions. And you can reach me at rachel.sheldon at ou.edu. And you can look me up on the website there, history.ou.edu. And I'm also on Twitter at Rachel Sheldon and look forward to answering any further questions that you might have. Rachel Sheldon, thank you so much for revealing to us the surprising world of Washington, D.C. during the 1840s and 1850s. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. As Rachel points out, the political divisions facing the United States today bear many similarities to those faced by Americans just before the Civil War. But unlike today, the politicians of the antebellum period talked and socialized with each other. They may have opposed each other by day on the floors of the House and Senate, But at night, they gathered at their favorite drinking halls, around the dinner table at their boarding houses, or they conversed with each other at the balls thrown by Washington socialites. Heck, the antebellum press even helped members of Congress interact with one another. They did this by providing space in their newspapers for politicians to express their party rhetoric in a place where their constituents would see it and where their political opponents could avoid hearing about it. If there's one lesson we can take away from the past to help us with the present, It's discussion and socialization. We need our politicians to socialize and get to know each other as people outside of their political rhetoric. I mean, if it could help men with such different politics as Abraham Lincoln and Alexander Stevens get along, then surely this technique might help our present day politicians bridge the conflict that divides them. You can find more information about Rachel, her book, Washington Brotherhood, plus notes concerning the information we talked about today on the show notes page benfranklinsworld.com slash zero seven eight. If you'd like to try out today's history lesson, you should join the Ben Franklin's World listener community on Facebook. It's a fun place to socialize, make new friends, and discuss history and current events. We don't always agree about historical interpretations or current events, but we do bond over our mutual love of the past. To join the community, visit benfranklinsworld.com and click on the big orange join now button on the home screen or text BF World 233 444. Finally, 
Do you think our politicians can close our present political divide by spending more time socializing with each other? Send your answers to Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment on the show notes page for this episode or in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.